Good morning, everyone. Today we're here to announce the first ever, ever multi-jurisdictional enforcement action targeting the Indian call center scam industry. More than 15,000 victims, including many new immigrants to the United States and the elderly, were targeted by a complex fraud scheme involving a network of call centers originating in India. This transnational criminal ring targeted victims in the United States, impersonating immigration officials, impersonating police, and other US and state and local government officials. These individuals demanded immediate payments from the people they called to avoid deportation, to avoid arrest, or to cover supposedly unpaid income taxes. In the process, these criminals took hundreds of millions of dollars from this scam alone. The victims included people all over the United States. As I said, they targeted primarily immigrants and the elderly. For example, one 85-year-old California woman was called by an individual impersonating an IRS employee who threatened her with immediate arrest unless she paid $12,000 for non-existent tax violations. She paid the money. In another example, the defendants called the same California man more than 20 times um, over a 20-day period, demanding payment for alleged tax violations. They succeeded in, in extorting that victim of $136,000. Other victims were scammed out of thousands of dollars, sometimes tens of thousands at a time, by criminals who purported to be immigration agents, who threatened to deport the people unless they paid up within 24 hours. Sometimes they made the individuals go immediately uh, to get money that could be given to these defendants. This morning, the Department of Justice, the Immigration and Customs Enforcement excuse me, the Immigration and Customs Enforcement's Homeland Security Investigation, the Treasury Inspector General for Tax Administration, and the Department of Homeland Security's Office of Inspector General took action to shut down this massive scheme. Federal and state law enforcement officials today have arrested 20 individuals. Uh, two other individuals are also in custody, and they've executed nine search warrants across eight states in a coordinated takedown of this organization. The arrests today are based on an indictment that was brought in the Southern District of Texas that charges 61 entities and individuals, including five call center groups located primarily in the United States and in India. They're charged with an international fraud and money laundering conspiracy. For nearly four years, this criminal network used a variety of, a variety of schemes to trick frightened individuals over the phone by tapping into their worst fears that they would be arrested they would be deported, they would face other problems with the US government or with state and local law enforcement authorities. Once a victim was hooked, the call centers relied on a network of US-based associates to cash out and launder the extorted funds as quickly as possible. This was done through a variety of prepaid debit cards, uh, which were often registered by conspirators using personal identifying information of close to 50,000 US-based identity theft victims, different people than the people who are the recipients of the calls. Um, these people would, and this would be done through MoneyGram or Western Union in addition to these cards. Uh, the indictment we unsealed and the arrests we made today really represent our commitment to identifying and prosecuting individuals behind these impersonation schemes and these telefraud schemes who, to, who seek to profit by exploiting some of the most vulnerable people in our community. Most importantly, as you're gonna hear in more detail from my colleagues on the stage today, we really wanna get the word out to the public that if you get one of these calls, it is not the US government calling you. Even if your caller ID says, as it as did in many of these instances, US government, IRS, or some other government agency, it is not the US government, it is a scam. The US government does not operate in this manner. We never call to demand that money be loaded immediately onto prepaid cards. Uh, the US government agencies do not call and demand immediate payments to avoid deportation or to avoid arrest. So if you receive a call like this, we ask the public don't pay any money and instead report the call to law enforcement. It's now my pleasure to turn the podium over to the United States Attorney for the Southern District of Texas, Kenneth Maggotson. Good morning, I'm Kenneth Maggotson. I'm the United States Attorney for the Southern District of Texas. It's a judicial district in Texas that takes up the entire metropolitan area of the city of Houston. 
and then the entire Texas Gulf Coast down through Corpus Christi to Brownsville and back up the Rio Grande River to include McAllen and Laredo. It's approximately eight and a half million people that live there and the case was brought in the Southern District of Texas and will be in the Houston Division and all the defendants that are arrested will make their initial appearances in our courthouse uh, located in Houston, Texas. Uh, I'd like to say that we have an obligation uh, to bring to bear the resources of not only my office, but the coordination with the Department of Justice and all the agencies you see here today against this kind of massive fraud, primarily because uh, not only of the vulnerability of the victims, but because they are using the United States government as the reason for people's uh, fears, that they should fear the government and send money over uh, various mechanisms and means to defraud them. Um, we represent the interests of the United States every day in court, and we're only as good as our word. And when it appears as if we're doing business over the phone in some kind of threatening or fraudulent manner, it reflects poorly on what we're trying to accomplish to do justice in the United States every day. And so we take this, uh, uh, we took this investigation seriously. We tried to bring to bear as much as possible, as demonstrated here by the people on this podium, to show our sincere efforts in trying to root out this kind of criminal activity. The Houston, the city of Houston is one of the most diverse cities in the world. We have representatives from all over the globe who reside in Houston and are extremely vulnerable to this kind of activity. And we're extremely proud that the indictment is brought within our district. And we're going to bring to bear everything we can to ensure that justice is done in this case. Thank you. I'd now like to introduce uh, Bruce Folkhart, who's from U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, Homeland Security Investigations Assistant Director. Well, thank you, Ms. Cole. Good morning. Uh, my name again is Bruce Folkhart, and I'm an Assistant Director with Homeland Security Investigations. I'm pleased to be here with my colleagues announcing the results of this large-scale international fraud investigation. Unfortunately, we are all too aware of these scams. Many of us have received these phone calls ourselves or had family members or friends who have. You may wonder how someone can be taken in these scams or think that you would never be a victim. But I can tell you that many of the victims in this case are savvy, successful, and law-abiding people. These scammers in this case, and in so many cases like this, are convincing. They are menacing and they are ruthless in their pursuit of their victims. They convey authority and a sense of urgency that leaves their victims terrified. The brazenness of the scammers in this case is, is chilling. A Southern California woman, woman battling cancer was warned by the scammers that police would be dispatched to her workplace uh, within the next few days and arrest her if she failed to pay $7,000 in purported outstanding tech tax debt related to her medical treatment. Mortified about the potential harm to her professional reputation if she was seen being led away in handcuffs, she complied. But the fraud doesn't always end with a phone call, as a man in Colorado Springs learned earlier this year. When the man failed to respond to repeated phone demands to withdraw money from the bank to pay four years of supposed back taxes, the scammers called 911 posing as the victim, telling the dispatcher he was armed and wanted to kill cops. Within minutes, there were more than a dozen heavily armed police officers surrounding the victim's residence where his daughter was home alone. Fortunately, no one was hurt. But as this scenario makes clear, the criminals involved in this far-reaching fraud scheme are willing to go to frightening lengths to try to collect from their victims. Today, we have taken significant action to address the criminal activity perpetrated by one group, a transnational criminal organization, which ran a call center fraud scheme that has impacted numerous victims in the United States and elsewhere. Our actions today are the culmination of separate investigations opened by ICE's Homeland Security Investigation, the Department of Homeland Security's Office of Inspector General, and the Treasury Inspector General for Tax Administration, all of which came together to form a joint investigation that resulted in today's takedown. This multi-agency investigation, which began in 2013, revealed that a transnational criminal organization was operating both here in the United States and overseas in India, making hundreds of millions of dollars. Today, we have arrested individuals in the United States 
as part of this scheme, and we will continue working with our foreign law enforcement partners to pursue additional people indicted in this case who are in India, excuse me, who are in India. Telephone fraud does not target a specific race, ethnicity, gender, age, education, or income level. Anyone with a phone can be victimized by telephone telemarketing scam artists. These unscrupulous scammers not only steal victims' money, but their sense of security and trust in their government officials. Today's actions will not only bring a sense of justice to the victims in this case, but this significant investigation will also help increase awareness for this type of fraud. To potential victims, our message, message today is simple. U.S. government agencies do not make these types of calls. And if you receive one, contact law enforcement to re report these suspected scams before you make a payment. Thank you again for joining us, and I look forward to answering your questions. So I'd now like to introduce the Treasury Inspector General for Tax Administration, Russell George. Thank you, Ms. Clark. Well, since 2013, my organization, the Treasury Inspector General for Tax Administration, has been reviewing cases related to this scam. We've received over 2 million, approximately 2 million contacts from individuals who've said that they've received solicitations. Of that number, approximately 10,000 people have acknowledged that they've fallen victim to this scam in the amount of $50 million. The people who are being targeted in many instances and the ones who are falling victim are part of the most vulnerable parts of our society, our population. It is imperative that we get the message out, as this press conference hopes to do, to ensure people do not continue to fall prey, notwithstanding the arrests that have been announced today. The one point that I want to make sure I drive home is do not, Americans, let your guard down. Notwithstanding the success of the arrests in this operation, these people are persistent. And so if you get phone calls, and I do expect that these people are resilient and will not give up, my advice to you is to just hang up and follow up with reports to TIGTA and other law enforcement agencies. I want to congratulate all of the law enforcement personnel who participated in this effort, and I look forward to continuing to work with them. Thank you. Thank you. So I'd now like to introduce the Department of Homeland Security Inspector General, John Roth. Thank you, Leslie. This uh, multi-agency, multi-year investigation provides significant and meaningful results for many of those who were wrongfully scammed out of their money. These are positive results. We can bring some fraudsters to justice. We can seize assets to begin to compensate some of the victims. And we get the word out about the nature of these scams. This was a possible because of two reasons. First, the folks who were victimized reported this to the authorities. We initiated this investigation because people overcame their embarrassment and their fear about reporting being scammed. Uh, those folks uh, oftentimes reported those to local authorities who then notified us. Um, and that is a very important uh, ability to be able to do that. Second, today's actions were a result of a lot of hardworking agents and prosecutors from different agencies working together in a coordinated fashion. The case was massive, uh, over 15,000 victims and over $250 million in stolen money. It required the use of dozens of uh, electronic search warrants, countless interviews, and tracing of thousands of financial transactions. The investigation touched every part of the United States. These results are only possible if you work together. And I applaud the efforts of not only my agents at the Homeland Security Inspector General's office, but the Treasury IG for Tax Administration and our partners at Homeland Security Investigations, working, of course, with the Department of Justice, the Criminal Division, and the U.S. Attorney's Office in Houston, as well as a number of U.S. Attorney's Offices around the country. These fraudsters exploited an immigrant's fear of deportation and preyed upon the insecurities of the elderly and others who were panicked by this kind of deceitful assertion of power. In many instances, the scammers portrayed themselves as immigration agents who called to collect uh, fines resulting from faulty immigration paperwork. 
uh, fines, if not paid, would result in the immigrants' immediate deportation. Often these, cumber these calls were from numbers that reflected that the call came from the National Call Center of the U.S. Citizen and Immigration Services Call Center. Uh, as the indictment reflects, they even were able to scam individuals who were U.S. citizens out of money uh, with this kind of uh, threat of deportation. We will be continue to be vigilant about this kind of activity and these kinds of schemes and we'll investigate the instances in which uh, immigrants and others are exploited because of their immigration status. Uh, thank you. So we'd also like to thank also present here on the, on the dais is uh, Lois, George, Lois Greisman, who is the associate director um, at the FTC. The FTC has been extraordinarily helpful. Um, they receive hundreds of thousands of complaints of this nature every month, and they've been extraordinarily helpful in coordinating the, this investigation. And now we'll take your questions. Yes, ma'am. So for, for this sweep, how big a piece of this whole problem does that represent, and how easily replaceable are these actors? It doesn't sound like uh, a lot of the folks were doing terribly sophisticated work and could be easily replaced. I mean, will this take out the scam? Will this make a dent in the scam? So I think every operation like this uh, makes a dent in the scam. Uh, you're right that a lot of the folks who we're arresting today can be replaced by other people. But I think the message of today's takedown, this is the first time we've done this in, in a coordinated nationwide way. And I think the message of this is we are now taking action against these kinds of groups in the United States, including many of the defendants in this case who are actually in India. We will be seeking their extradition to the United States. And I think that's the message that that folks in India who are engaged in this activity and in the United States should take away is that we are watching and we are, we are paying attention to this and we're taking appropriate action. Yes. There are a lot of clues on these calls that would sort of immediately suggest to many, many people that this is a scam and this is fake and yet you indicated that even savvy individuals have fallen for this and that these scammers are persistent. Can you walk us through what it is that they say on the call that winds up convincing otherwise apparently intelligent people? Well, these folks are con men let's, let's, and con women, let's put it uh, you know, straight. Um, so they attack us or attack the, uh, the, the consumer or the person on the other end of the line uh, where they are most vulnerable. And they've done their research. There, is, there has been some research done, public open source research, uh, with these folks that are on the internet, unfortunately, Facebook, those types of things, where they know some of these vulnerabilities or at least have some background regarding these people. And then they'll work off of that. They know some specifics, and then they'll go from there. And that's how they attack their vulnerabilities. Yes, sir. So it sounds as if the call centers in India were the ones in charge of this. Can you just explain for us why, why did they need the 20 or so people in the US? What role were the people here in the United States playing that they couldn't have just done by phone for me? So um, I think there's a chart that's up on the slides that shows what various people's role was. It may be hard to read from where you are right now, but um, it should, I think, also be in your press packet. Basically. The people in the United States uh, were, cri were critical to the plan because this was a situation where individuals were being asked to buy prepaid debit cards or to buy other kind of gift cards. Those gift cards had to be cashed out and monetized, and that had to happen in the United States. The money in this case did not leave the United States. The money uh, was, was put in various accounts in the United States, and the indictment details a lot of different ways in which that was done, which I won't repeat here. But essentially, the money was put into accounts and then in India, um, the call centers would work with the Hawaladar, one of whom is charged in, in the indictment today. Um, Hawaladar, just to give an example, there may be an individual in India whose child was attending college in the United States, and that individual may have wanted to make a payment, a tuition payment, um, to the United States, and they may have gone to the Hawala in India and given them X amount of money for the tuition. The Hawala in India would then contact a Hawala in the United States which would actually give the money to whoever was paying the tuition. And that the, the scammers would actually be funding, would be giving money to the Hawala in the U.S. Uh, to essentially fund that tuition payment. So the person whose tuition was being paid didn't have any necessarily any reason to know that the money was being funded by the scam. So people in the United States were critical to essentially cash out uh, the money that they were getting. Uh, in the back, yes. Yeah, as, as most of the defendants are either in India or they seem to be from the Indian descent, uh, were they preying on, on just uh, South, uh, East Asian, uh, South Asian uh, immigrants or, or Latino immigrants too or other countries? They were preying on a lot of different people. I would say that 
they were praying, they certainly were praying on South uh, Asian immigrants, but they were also praying on US citizens who were born and raised in the United States. They were pray praying on elderly people. They were praying on people from other countries who were living in the United States. So they were pretty um, non-denominational in, in their targeting, although I would say they did, there, was a, there were more South Asian folks than there were others. The, uh, yes, they, uh, the Indians uh, announced that they had arrested about 70 people, um, I think, last week. Mm -hmm. uh, are those the folks that you're seeking to try to get extradited? No, that was a separate scheme. So this is a different scheme than the one that the Indians uh, are, took an enforcement action in, and, and we want to commend the Indians for having done that um, because we think it's really important that they, in addition to our enforcement efforts, that they engage in enforcement efforts in this area too. And obviously they have the people right there in India, which we have to go through the extradition process. Yes, ma'am. Of the hundreds of millions that were lost, how much can a victim here in the United States expect to see back? Unfortunately, they may not see anything back. Uh, we're trying as best we can to trace the money and to seize whatever money is still available. We will seek, and the indictment seeks uh, money judgments be entered against the defendants following conviction. That, of course, depends on what kind of money the defendants may have or may, that we may be able to find. So the sad thing about these scams is often once the money's paid, it's gone. And we're, we'll do our best to try to get as much as we can, but that's, that's a very difficult thing because of the way these scams work. Yes, sir. Is what you're announcing today one big hierarchical organization, or is this you sweeping up a variety of call centers that just sort of separately ended up doing the same thing? So it's sweeping up um, multiple call centers that kind of worked in conjunction with one another. So there's, there's overlap between, there are different call centers, but they, they coordinate and work together. And are there leaders you're going after that might have been like the ultimate people who now hold most of the money? There are people who are uh, among the defendants named of, of, who are in India who are the equity owners or, or partial equity owners of some of the call centers. Yes, Carrie. Can you um, explain to the extent possible now whether um, cooperators, electronic evidence, um, the hawalas themselves uh, led you to unravel what you have unraveled so far about this scheme? How'd you craft it? Well, I, I think it's a, a couple of things. One are the complaints from the individuals themselves, and then there was a series of uh, the ability to uh, do search warrants, for example, on email accounts, that kind of thing, to be able to sort of understand the scheme as it went. But it's a combination of, you know, good old uh, electronic uh, gumshoeing uh, kind of a thing, as well as the, the victims themselves were able to put together a fairly um, uh, comprehensive uh, picture of the scheme. topic, one off topic. Uh, for the on topic, what steps did the federal government take to warn consumers that this scam was going on? I mean, I covered the Department <coughs> of Justice, but I found out about it from victims on Facebook. Uh, Russell? Thank you. Uh, TICTOR has engaged in a number of public service announcements. We've made uh, television appearances, both in local as well as national media outlets. Uh, we've prepared uh, online messages. Uh, We've prepared flyers, every, and we've requested that members of Congress reach out to their constituents, and many have, to uh, alert them to this problem. When did all that start? Um, it started over a year ago, it did. And, uh, and it's obviously had some success because the number of victims um, has leveled off, and then in the wake of the most recent arrests, they have fallen. So. Uh, just one more question, kind of coming back with the first question. If how big of this a deal this was, if this whole thing were a whole piece of pie, you know, a pie, how big of a piece was this operation in this sort of scheme in call center? So I think that the call center schemes are extensive, um, and they target many of them target the United States, not all of them. We've also seen activity in Canada, targeting Canada, targeting Europe, but the lion's share of these kind of schemes. They're targeting us because we have an IRS and we have a lot of immigrants and a lot of people are fearful of the government for whatever reason, maybe because of the countries they originated in, I don't know. But, um, you know, like any kind of major fraud, telemarketing fraud, you can only do what's in front of you at, at any given time. I'm not saying this is wiping out telemarketing scams, but as, as you just heard, because of the arrests in India a few weeks ago, um, we have seen, and I think because of the publicity that the FTC and the IRS and others have gotten out there, 
we have seen a drop off in, in the success rate of these scams. And I think it's really important for the scammers in India to know that the United States is looking at this and is watching them. And they could, if they're going to engage in that activity, they could be extradited to the United States and could sit in jail in the United States for several years if they engage in this kind of activity. Yes, sir. Yes. I'd like to ask a follow-up to your last comment. How is it, can you explain how U.S. law uh, provides the authority to charge people in India for carrying out these crimes in the United States? So these crimes took place in the United States, um, and under our, under our laws, we're, we have jurisdiction over fraud that essentially occurs in the United States, whether the perpetrators are inside or outside the United States. So these people are calling the United States. That by itself would give us jurisdiction. They're taking money from people in the United States. Um, they are engaged in various financial transactions in the United States to get that money back to the scammers. Um, so the bulk of the activity, really all that happens in India is the calls. Uh, and the bulk of the activity that's happening in this case is in the United States. So thank you. Thank you.